Okay, hello everybody and thank you for joining us in this series of talks that we've organised today for the 50th anniversary of Belmas in order to record some people's viewpoints who've been significant in our educational leadership landscape, specifically on the focus of our research interest group, which is leadership preparation and development. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Ching Gu, who is director of the UCL Centre for Educational Leadership. And Ching's going to answer some standard questions that we're asking our other participants so that we can have these talks as a, 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 an archive for people who are interested in leadership preparation and development moving forward. Thank you for joining me today, Ching. It's really great for you to join us and to be part of this archive of talks. It's really much appreciated. So first of all, Ching, in your role, what are your views on educational leadership? And I'm aware that that is, of course, a very general question. Yes, it's, um, uh, I, I, I thought long and hard about this, Deb. Um, I can't emphasize um, enough about the importance of educational leadership because as we have learned from our research, um, educational leadership, especially um, the leadership of school principals, um, is, I would say, the most important in terms of making a difference to student outcomes, to students' achievements and their experience in, in, in learning and in school. Um, and of course, you know, um, many school leaders, um, they may not have direct impact on what's going on within the classroom, but just to think about it, for example, they recruit the teachers, they create the conditions to um, enable them to work together, to create the collegiality and collaboration within the schools. So a lot of those in strict, you know, academic terms are indirect impact. But it also tells us, you know, it is really who sits in those principal's office. Um, in you know those uh, and and through the principal's leadership, the senior leadership within the schools really make um, a profound impact. Um, not only you know pupils actually through the teachers, how teachers feel about what the profession is like, what teaching is like, and whether they feel motivated and committed, wanting to teach and to and to be able to teach well. So all these you know, how teachers wanting to give their best um, to their students and therefore children are more likely to feel happier and, and learn happier and, um, and grow healthier in, in schools. Um, at the moment, I'm leading a ESRC Research Council funded project on how schools as enabling spaces for primary school children in rural communities in South Africa. And we've just learned enormously amount through working with the, um, the South African government, as well as um, local districts and schools understanding, you know, despite the challenges, there are people, especially school leaders, who can make a difference, who can beat the odds. But I suppose the question for the system is, how collectively, because education is not just about schools, it's, it's, it's a responsibility for the society, is how together as a system, we all play a role. And that includes you and I as um, you know, colleagues working in higher education research uh, about school leadership to make sure that our school leaders are able to fulfill their um, moral responsibilities and, and through their leadership, enable our teachers to teach well and to, you know, um, to be able to make a difference to the children's learning and development. It's a bit long-winded, but I no, not to at all. no, I think you've covered a lot of things there that are really central to our field, Ching, particularly that whole kind of concept of moral, moral purpose and that wider understanding, and also pointing out the individual learning that we get from every project that we do in higher education so it was really interesting to hear that example of your your recent South African projects I think I think that's that's, that's a really great answer thank you 
So in your role as an educational leader um, running the UCL centre that, that you run, so you, you said just now, you know, it does impact on us in our individual roles that we have. Uh, what challenges do you see clearly facing our, our current field? Right. Uh, it's, it's a question, it's a timely question that because as you know, school leaders, I'm speaking as a school governor and also um, vice chair of a multi academy trust. Um, and as we know, the pandemic has um, created a lot of challenges for us. But I just want, wanted to, to use the, the opportunity to also say it has also created opportunities, you know, as well as the challenges, but also opportunities for us to see actually um, to enable schools to conquer those uncertainties, um, which fundamentally is what school leadership is all about, understanding um, the challenges and to be able to be flexible but what we have seen that worked well in certain schools from our research is where they have the foundation for collaboration working more closely with the communities you know all those kind of um educational leadership theories you and i probably have read and written about it ourselves so what really makes the schools um resilient um continue to be those that if they are well led by leaders who share a very clear sense of direction and vision and to be able to use the um, challenges as well as opportunities to gel people together because we have seen as you know some papers yep. beginning to come up um, people value more about the collaboration and also the collaborations with the communities parents are more likely to get involved with the schools i think all those are almost um payoffs from those challenges you know that we can we can see to be able to you know at the end of the day what educational leader wanted to achieve is to make a difference to the learning experience and to the he healthy development of a child and to be able to do that um i wanted to say that we it's not that we don't know a lot about leadership and improving schools it's just the current pandemic may have created um may have amplified certain challenges therefore make the um you know, certain kind of adjustment and decision making process has to be much quicker and faster. Mm -hmm. But then looking back, what really has worked well is when teachers are able to support each other intellectually, emotionally. Um, and I think we should probably pause a little bit now. We have done really well over the last year or so, if you think about it, looking at pupil attendance, you know, nationally over 80% of the children after, you know, the, the lockdown actually go back to schools. And those are positive messages. And I think it's probably more productive for us, uh, certainly given our role to think what really has worked, you know, it's not all um, negative or pessimistic. Actually, many schools have many experiences and good lessons about what how they have continued to support children, support their well-being, support their learning. Um, and I would say, you know, learning how to conquer technology, but we shouldn't confuse learning how to use technology with um, using technology to support children's learning. And I do think as a profession, in terms of our professionalism, in terms of the knowledge and skills of educational leaders and teachers, that is an area I think that has been talked a lot over the last few you know, months about not just technology, but technology facilitated learning, how we, um, you know, therefore making our um, own teachers and schools um, provide the kind of experience that's more flexible and more responsive. Um, but on the other hand, to focus again on those basics about what makes um, a good school, you know, how to continue to develop our teachers. And I think that's another area we have seen. And I remember 
remember um, Kevin Collins mentioned only last week at our first virtual event, um, the kind of importance that certainly from his perspective and also from the needs of the profession, we need to look again um, what a teacher's needs are and how as a system we provide the kind of professional learning and development opportunities that would cater for the needs and not just the teachers but also school leaders um i remember um there's a very old chinese saying um once you become um a head teacher or a ceo of a mat um, a very senior role that's it's like standing on the tip of a mountain it's very cold and lonely but i think therefore i you know the other challenges um facing school leaders um and up I probably would say facing the system is how we provide also the professional development opportunities um, and professional learning communities for our school leaders as well. So they feel supported, not just emotionally, but also professionally, so they can share the best practice and knowing that someone somewhere else um, is experiencing similar kind of challenges and are able to support each other and to um, not only survive but also thrive together i think you know that going back to the basics of the importance of collaboration and the importance of learning communities to make how schools are successful and i think that those i think um is probably we need to um consider more about in the next phase of returning mm -hmm. Yeah. And certainly as our center, sorry, Deb, as our center, we're just proud that we are given the um, the uh, grants from the government leading as one of the national providers for early career framework, um, as well as the new MPQs, because that's really um, stays true to our values as a center for educational leadership because we do believe as research has told us many times over the last you know god knows how many years um the importance of developing teachers is at the heart of how we make a school difference and how we make you know how we make um a group of schools different to um support children's learning and development no, I think I think that's probably the space actually that discussion is where you and I have intersected in in the system, you know, obviously at the moment, as director of a teaching school alliance watching the system change into these teaching school hubs and watching the big six for the early career providers and then the big nine for the national professional qualifications be rolled out now in, in the way that they are. I think there's a really interesting conversation isn't there for us around the way in which leaders handle that change system-led change and and the challenge that does that and I think it's you know for those of us from academic backgrounds it's quite interesting when you look at the the range of providers of that early career framework and the range of that providers for those national professional qualifications who are in large part of course responsible for providing particularly through the MPQs as we know that leadership preparation and development as people work their way through the system uh, and the the sort of DFE mantra, Department for Education mantra, which I think probably has always been there about recruit into teaching, recruiting people into teaching, training them in teaching, and then retaining them in the system. But now we have in England specifically a very tight focus on that recruiting, training and retaining mantra. I, I think it is really interesting to, to, to see who's providing some of that support. And it's it's great, isn't it, that there is a, a higher education kind of dimension, I think, to to that provision. So the, the third question was around how leaders should kind of handle that challenge. And I think your last question, your asked the last answer actually probably touched on on some of that, how leaders should handle the challenge, because it is about how leaders are in this kind of unique and isolated position looking 
looking out often at the system and yet that challenge is very much around a lot of the things you've spent your career researching around the collaboration of, of groups of people in education and how things work when people come together is there anything you want to add I, I think you may have answered some of that question in, in your last answer but is there anything you want to add to that around the challenge of leaders in in the position Yes, I, I, I suppose from um, as a provider of professional um, learning and development opportunities and programs for school leaders, and we do see the challenges school leaders face in terms of finding the time and the energy to get engaged in, in um, opportunities or programs um, such as the MPQs um, and or the ECF. Um, and I, I agree with you strongly, Deb, and I think that's you, you, you beautifully summarized our motivation to get involved in the early career framework as we are a leadership center. But we do work very closely with the middle and the senior leaders and our, our approach, and that's underpinned by the value, is we work with and for the profession. So we do um, work with schools and work with groups of schools to develop that middle tier of um, capacity um, so that they have their own professional development opportunities and, and personnel who have the capabilities um, to enhance their own provision for professional learning and development. Like, you know, we would work with facilitators, we would work senior leaders, they are really um, part of the team. And, and the other, so, and certainly from the provision perspective about engaging the school leaders in the professional learning and development, because we do agree, you know, as you rightly said, as a HEI, higher education institution, we are, we are really just really delighted um, and feeling honored that we have the opportunity to translate our research, our understanding and knowledge about what we think uh, how school leaders make a difference, uh, how they learn better into our programs. And we really feel very encouraged that we had this positive response from, from many schools and the teaching school hubs as well. Um, because it really matters to us that we, through this kind of collaboration, and I do think it's one model of enable school leaders, helping school leaders to handle the challenge, to go back to your question, is, is kind of um, to through, through working with them. And we, um, we create the opportunities. I mean, one of the, I mumble a little bit, so I wanted to go back. So what really matters to us is to um, ensure that those leaders professional learning and what they learn in the programs is really relevant and responsive to their own context of work. And that is what we believe um, ours, I hope I don't sound too arrogant here, but I do believe that's how, where we put our energy um, and we believe probably where our approach is slightly different. Um, certainly for the ECF, for example, we in the year two, we use an inquiry approach. We encourage, we would develop this inquiry projects because we, we do acknowledge, you know, although it's called early career teachers, but each individual is different when they start learning journey, when the school leaders starting their MPQ journey, um, their, their prior experience, their knowledge and skills are very different and their contexts are different. So we wanted to, you know, to through those inquiry approach and in implementation projects, for example, for the MPQs, we want school leaders to think about the connections of those teacher standards and the leadership standards and think what how they would find the connections and apply those that are particularly relevant to their own context and i think that is as we know from from research how um, and why some some professional learning programs are more effective in terms of enabling participants to make a difference to their practice because fundamentally we want to encourage them to think to reflect in and on their their practice within the context so um it is challenging it's probably because it's less prescriptive 
um, it may not be felt like everyone's cup of tea. But I do think as um, doesn't matter what program we provide across all the nine all the, or all the six on the ECF. And um, the profound question is we collectively understand um, and share that experience across different providers to understand how we continue to support our leaders learn better and embed their learning in the context and create the platforms that they also have that communities of learning and that is really important it's also a way of um as we've learned from workshops with our school leaders if they could see so and so is doing better and making better progress that would probably be a quite a good motivation for them to catch up so that is um you know i i, I do think again going back it's it's you know the basics that we often talk about the collaborations the social capital the social foundations um of of learning and to create that platform to enable school leaders um understand that they are not alone mm, i think that's a really great answer ching you know just in terms of how leadership preparation and development works and how we as field reflect on the individual and unique positions that those not just the leaders but as you rightly say the early career teachers have at every point so having projects where they are you know really thinking about that and having those opportunities to embed that into their practice as they go along as part of their journeys you know it, it is absolutely fundamental isn't it to how we improve as a profession yes yeah and make, make them feeling supported. And I think this is where um, we wanted to show in our research and well, how we think about teacher retention, because I don't think teachers and school leaders are too, you know, cons I mean, of course, um, when we talk about workload, I have to, you know, we talked about the, the, the challenges in terms of time energy that school leaders and teachers um, face to be engaged in their learning but we also know that it you know to be able to do their job well they would get stronger sense of job satisfaction from what they do therefore fulfill their original purpose to become a teacher to become a school leader to make a difference so it is you know it's so I, I just it, it's certainly in our work we wanted to people to think more creatively and more holistically about workload. It's not just about the extra number of hours people work. It's actually the meaningfulness of their energy and the time spent, whether they could see themselves learning, they could see that they've actually enabled their children learn. And that buzz, we know that from, from research over the decades consistently internationally, that buzz really keeps many teachers in teaching and you know as contexts change pandemic for example creates new contexts new, uh, new challenges for the profession therefore placing um, the kind of collaborative learning um, environment as a system I, I do think is the right way forward mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I know I, I undertook my own national professional qualification on executive leadership, the MPQEL programme. And the, the main feedback we had as a group in our last session, having worked as a group together over 18 months on that programme, was that the, the a lot of that group were primary head teachers. So a lot of them hadn't had time to undertake MAs in education, hadn't really done much you know, kind of professional learning after they'd undertaken their MPQH actually to get their posts. And virtually everybody said that it wasn't the opportunity to undertake the learning it was little things that sound little but are absolutely what you're talking about such as the creation of that professional learning community such as having a whatsapp group so on our whatsapp group people were sort of putting things going does anybody else have this and you get a deluge of comments where everybody else says yes i have that too it is that shared opportunity to come together and engage so yes you're engaging in it formally with the reading that we did for that mpql program and the sessions that we had and the tasks that we had to do but actually the creation 
of, of that PLC was absolutely critical as part of that, of that process. And that was, that was a really interesting thing for me to kind of witness firsthand as part of the group, because obviously I've taught to groups before about what that involves, but it was, it was a very different process actually being part of that collaborative process. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely agree. I think that's what's often um, we, because I'm just evaluating um, the um, finalizing our reports for the evaluation of research schools in opportunity areas as a place based model for school improvement. That social foundations in, um, really underpin a place or groups, uh, schools, what they can or cannot achieve. And I think, you know, when you talk about leadership, talk about improvement, um, it's not just only about intellectually, about competences. I mean, I have strong reservations about the competence-based approach to leadership development um, uh, because it doesn't give you the nuanced picture about what the system really looks like. And I think that's fundamental for school leaders um, to be able to lead well. Um, but really it showed that you know the, the the really basic human sides of connection the mutual support the intellectual um excitement you know really creates um that in many ways without it um you know very less likely you would see sustainable um outcomes from those place-based approach for um school improvement Mm, absolutely yeah so i guess that brings us very neatly on to our next question then just in terms of the difference around that competency-based approach versus the far more kind of nuanced approaches which is should principles be qualified uh, and you know we both have read a lot of tony bush's work and and, and know tony and, and the work he's done through email um, and I know when we first launched the Leadership Preparation and Development Rig back in 2015, Tony was um, very, um, I think, unhappy is probably the right word to use about the fact that MPQH had gone from being a mandatory qualification to a non-mandatory qualification. Um, and I have heard him talk about the fact that when we had the MPQH as a mandatory qualification, perhaps in the English system, we had without knowing it at the time, a sort of golden age of, of leadership preparation and, and development. So do you think principals or head teachers should be qualified? And if so, how should they be qualified? Um, I would say that I, I'd agree with Tony um, to a large extent. Um, I enjoyed working with Tony, I have deep respect for him and his work. Um, because for me, it's not the qualifications themselves, it's the process of achieving the qualifications. Um, you know, it's, it's about all the things you and I have talked about here. It's that, it's that kind of um, socializing themselves into a community, which people, you know, um, of, um, um, similar kind of um, mindset, similar kind of visions and understanding actually to be able to become a aspirational school leader, what it might look like, what your peers look like, to make that professional judgment and, and to, to, to think. And I think that itself, because learning is not just about, it's, it's not about the qualification. It really is about that learning process and challenging our participants. Um, and I, I do think it's, it's, it's a, as a system, it gives a certain amount of confidence in terms of um, our next generations of school leaders that they've had the training, not the training or qualify, they've had the intellectual professional challenge to think they have seen what it looks like in a system 
systematic way. And, and because of that, I do think um, it is um, really important. And, uh, and again, you know, sitting where I am, you know, UCL Center for Educational Leadership, we're just a delight and that's why we spent a lot of time putting together the bids. We want to be part of the journey with many of the school leaders because we do firmly believe in it. It's, um, we believe in the importance of professional learning and development um, and the role it plays in teacher and leadership retention. We also believe that, you know, the importance of that learning journey and we want to make a difference. So I hope um, that's answered your question. No, that absolutely does answer the question. And I know that you will have seen across the sector what I have seen as well, which is when leaders engage with those MPQs in senior leadership, in headship, in executive leadership, they, because they've had to do that at various points as part of their workload, they've then realised that actually they can find the time and the space for those. And then once they've done those MPQs, you know, I, I've taught many leaders, as I'm sure you have, who've then cashed those you know, in through an accreditation of prior learning into units on masters in educational leadership and have moved on through masters and through MBA educational leadership journeys. And so they've really engaged with that whole wider learning because of the MPQ kind of set them off on a path which perhaps they might otherwise not have engaged in. So I think that there are huge amounts of system benefits, aren't, aren't there? Yeah, completely. Yeah. Um, so the next question is, should leadership development then be before or after appointment? And I, I, I suspect I know the answer that you're going to give us, but, but please just talk us through that. If I say both, is that what you yeah. think? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right, yeah. And I think most people watching this as part of our archive of leadership preparation and development would, you know, kind of expect, if you look at the way in which the Department for Education in England have set out the new MPQs from this September, so we should probably say that we're recording this now in May 2021, so from September 2021, the new newly developed National Professional Qualifications come online, and and when you look at how they're set out, they're very much as before and after stepping stones of leadership positions, aren't they, as part of that recruit, retain um, mantra that, that we have. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think all of us would probably think both. <laughs> yes, that's right, because it is a continuum, because otherwise I think many of our leaders would get bored as well. You know, it's, it's um, I think learning is inevitable because, you know, it's... Um, children are different generations generations they are different the context is different so just think about technology how much that has evolved um, and during the pandemic how quickly the technology has picked up to enable us so all those so you know i, I just think um that also keeps that excitement of learning keeps many many leaders going on i think the danger is if if leadership becomes soul management it becomes chore I think that's where um, we will have, you know, I'm sure you have seen that in your own research and work as well, really heartbreaking examples and experiences. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And it is about how people balance their own individual needs with the needs that the system has of them at various points, isn't it? And I think that's a, that is, is very tricky for some people at different points in their, in their careers. Um, so I think we, again, have come nicely to the next question, which is about the developing the sort of key aspects of a normative um, development programme. And I wonder what thoughts uh, we have echoes of Tony Bush again in, in, in this question, I think. But Yeah, gosh, I have to be careful to see what Tony's going to think um, <laughs> about what I'm going to say. Um, I think... There are, um, I mean, Tony has written extensively and at depth about those key qualities and key values um, that make um, a great leader. And I think for leadership programs, those um, qualities, and I'm trying to avoid competencies because competencies and skills simply give a kind of list like and the examples um, themselves um, may strike 
um, taking you know values as an example or competence to create teams those are important but actually on the other hand there are also processes and structures that school leaders need to understand so and so one one thing is i think yes so you know the any leadership programs should um present the um participants with the opportunity to have an overview about those qualities those values and what really school leadership means again it's about in encouraging them to think deeply about leadership um, rather than um if i've ticked boxes of all these competencies and i think i can do all those i can be a good leader i don't think that works that way and so related to that is Certainly in our MA programs, especially when I was working in Nottingham, um, we, um, I think the field has moved on from focusing on different models of leadership. I think there, you know, each one has different focus, like value-based um, servant leadership, instructional leadership, you know, the, the list goes on. But I think over the last, certainly since over the last 10 years, I would say, um, maybe shorter than that, there's more evidence actually telling us to look at the system, to, to think um, what really makes a leader, a school leader, and school leadership successful is to have the insight to be able to um, be flexible and be responsive to the needs of the context of the capacity and capability of the school, the culture, and the pupils, the parents, and the community, and whether one model will be, um, you know, will fit for the purpose um, over time and across different contexts. I really question that. And I, I think um, certainly in our own work, we've written about um, successful school leaders would do both the transformational and tra and instructional leadership. It really depends on the phases of school improvement that considers the capability and the capacity of the school um, and also of the school culture. And more recently, certainly editing a um, encyclopedia with Ken Lithwood on school leadership and governance. And, um, you know, Ken himself has started writing about integrated leadership. I think, you know, that's, for me, that's probably, if we take the normative as more different models and, you know, the different approaches, this is the way, but actually, um, it is more important to, because it takes a system to educate a child, then it is important for this, for every school leader to see the system and, and see themselves within that system to maneuver through understanding the needs, the characteristics, the capacity of the context, and then come up with the leadership strategies and practices that are um, context sensitive and responsive to the needs of the teachers, the needs of the community, the needs of the pupils. I think those are really important elements for leadership development programs to include as well. Yes, I, it's, it's really fascinating, isn't it? Because I think that's, for me personally, that's the bit that we actually don't spend quite enough time talking about. And, you know, the, the number of leaders I guess I've met recently in you know, relatively new posts in relatively new organizations who almost you know they're, they're they're good people doing their best but they are slightly restricted I think by their own lack of understanding of the wider landscape because they're in new organizations they naively think their new organizations are going to be the answer to everything you know which of course you need to be when you're setting up something new and it's for the first time you know if there wasn't a purpose for doing it you wouldn't have the motivation for doing it but it is about that holistic view of your knowledge and understanding of the space that you have of where you sit in the system and how you help to hold that system 
together as part of that role that you you play and the role of course that everybody else plays as as part of that and I, I think for, for me given what I see in our, our landscape that's actually a really pivotal question for the the here and now with the amount of change the educational landscape in England has had at school leadership level probably over the last sort of 10 or 12 years yeah absolutely that I, i'm really enjoying this conversation i agree uh, you, you summarized beautifully yet again i think i think you know if we take about we we had a esrc project looking at how successful secondary schools in like government policies because the fundamental question for us is we have studied a group of schools in a large group of schools in the in the system despite the policy change the, despite the change of offset inspection regimes, despite the change of government, local authorities, despite the change of school governance structures, they are still able to do well. And we wanted to learn more about those schools and leadership is really at the heart of yeah. what makes a difference. They're playing a very important mediating role. That's, um, you know, what the school policy, it, to a large extent, we can see reflects the, the, the values um, and the really leadership insights of those um, school principals, especially. Um, and, you know, I think it, it is, again, it's about understanding, understanding the system and, and then to be able to make those kind of professional leadership judgments that is fit for purpose. You know, certain, we invited some school leaders to look back at their, um, the journey of their school's development. The best example we had was a secondary school. So the school had um, really significant Im um, improvement based on pupil progress. So um, you know, contextual value added, we, we, we did the data selection um, over a decade. And it was interesting to see the, the, the head teacher and deputy head sit in different rooms, draw the same picture about how the schools had, had improved over the, over the last 10 years and the key leadership policies, leadership decisions made that had made you know, the the school continue to improve. I think those are the kind of lessons and experiences that we really need to help our new leaders to understand. Um, yeah. You know that that holistic understanding and understanding that I don't have the, for example, the trust in my school, the 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 the, the capacity in my school to do the, for example, di the distribution of leadership yet. You know, but I'm building that. So you know it. it it is about, um, in, in, in summary, as you beautifully summarized, it, it's about seeing the system um, and how they then mediate the system to create the structures and cultures within the school. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think I, I know, again, the answer that you're probably going to give to this next question, but I, I, I suspect, you know, it, I think it's probably still worth asking anyway. Um, but it, it, is individual leadership development then better done as a team based activity in itself because of that learning journey that comes from it is fascinating isn't it you know because often leadership development is thought of as one person undertaking an mpq course one person extending that to a, a master's course one person setting off on a doctor of educational uh, leadership journey but actually they're team-based activities aren't they as as we know as leadership in itself it's, it's, you know, like one flower does make a garden or individual flowers not necessarily make a beautiful garden. I think, you know, I was just extremely thrilled. Um, I, I, I assume you know my answer. So, uh, you know, I'm just carry on to talk about the importance <laughs> of the teams because what what it was fascinating we're, we're yet i mean the report will be published in june um this year our evaluation of the research schools in opportunity areas what we found fascinating was if you see the school um taking the leadership development um so the research schools um perceived high quality cpd by the participants you know that, that was um the evidence was very strong in there but what really has made made it work is the kind of 
I mean, we, we, we created a structural equation model to understand the, the process of change. And it was fascinating to see the antecedents of the change in individual teachers' practice is not the CPD. The CPD contributes to individuals' improved um, knowledge and understanding of research use in, you know, specifically that, that particular kind of CPD. But the antecedent is the school leadership's um, kind of focus on professional learning and development and how they set the culture and the structure to bring in the CPD to contribute, to enhance that particular culture regarding research use. And the CPD only improved individuals' understanding, but it's the individual's improved ability contributing to the culture change. And it's a culture change leads to change, teachers change in practice in classroom. I think that just, I mean, it's all common sense, but it still kind of really encouraged us to, 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 to see that in a different context. Research is telling us the same thing about the importance of building that culture and therefore teachers are more likely to change their practice and then we are more likely to change in student outcomes. So we also found if, the teach, if there is a strong leadership for professional learning and development in general, you're more likely to see better Mm -hmm. of that outcomes. I was quite scared when I saw the, um, saw the connection. You couldn't draw uh, the connection back. You know, it really showed, uh, taking us back to the beginning of our conversation, Deb, is the importance of creating the cultures and conditions yeah. for um, teacher development. And that's what fundamentally how we make uh, a great school and how we make a great system. Yeah. And, and that, you know, the next question is around anything you think we should be focusing on as part of our research interest group in leadership preparation and development. But actually, that's it, isn't it? It's about looking at how th those connections work and focusing in on perhaps the individual components of those so how enthusiastic a leader is when they introduce these opportunities to a whole staff base for example you know if you haven't got somebody who's really engaged in that journey you, you, clearly you're going to get a less positive outcome of, of that journey so I wonder what, what you think about that in terms of perhaps where we as a research interest group focus are sort of put the spotlight if you like on all of those different aspects of, of LPD. I, I, I'm excited by this question because it took me back to um, a, a, a bit um, application experience. Um, I think I can probably say, because it was not, it, it's, um, we were invited by a funder to, um, to look into effective CPD in, in schools and therefore what kind of training um, can provide. So as, as a researcher, we kind of really emphasized that, you know, it's simply, uh, we know subject-based CPD can be effective, but there's a big condition behind that, which is, you know, how the schools um, are actually shaping those learning to create uh, follow-up actions to create not just individual learning because you know often when we, I think there's enough evidence telling us that um, sending staff to individual CPDs may not be a necessary it may, may not be an effective way of um, of improving creating a whole school um, kind of change and improvement in, in practice leadership by in leadership understanding is very important in that and I do think as a community we need to say more about this we need to share more the kind of evidence um, to actually say yes you know individual um, the word works individual CPDs they may all have certain purpose but actually there's I would, we need to as a research community to provide a more and informative evidence to show to the profession to show the, 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 you know to the policy makers um, as well as looking at the um, creation of those professional development opportunities you also need to look at, at 
you know, how within schools and within group of schools, we can enact the learning to make the learning effective at a school level, um, you know, because in each individual, um, Every school is a great school. David Hopkins wrote um, that book quite a few years ago. In every school, we can find good and outstanding practice, but the fundamental difference between an effective school and a less effective school is in an effective school, that outstanding practice is a consistent school understanding and practice and how we create those. And I think it is really important um, and share that best evidence to help school leaders to understand that by simply sending a few teachers onto CPD training courses is not the, the magic key to actually transform your for um, schools. We actually found in our research evidence simply buy-in is not enough. The school leaders really need to understand how that particular innovation can actually um, be aligned, closely aligned and feed into the teaching culture, the learning culture within your school as part of the learning and teaching, not an add-on. Yeah, no, I think I think that's exactly it, isn't it? So the development of that whole holistic culture and not just in that school or that group of schools, but then the replication of that across the system in, in, a, in a better and more collaborative way than, than we've managed to date. And I think that's that in itself, I think, Jing, gives us lots of things to think about in the research interest group in terms of where we could put the spotlight to collect the data in uh, the data in, the, in that way. But I think the answer that you've given us there really does bring that very neatly again to the next question which is what is the role of Belmas? It's the 50th anniversary of Belmas this year. Belmas, as many people watching this will know, has kind of mutated through and developed through those different roles from being BMAS through becoming Belmas with the leadership element more on it. Perhaps the, the um, focus is at the moment in our kind of current situation much more around the educational leadership, but we've got groups such as Seppels, which is one of our other rigs where the focus is very much on you know the the critical nature of the scholarship in the discipline and the um the the role of administration historically in that in that whole kind of journey that we've we've had in educational leadership so i wonder what do you think is the role of belmas itself as an organization not just in terms of the running of the rigs but for for us as a as a field i think it's um I'm, 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 I'm feeling quite emotional at the moment um, because I, you know, our conversation and Deb really enjoyed it. I think I do believe Belmas has a very significant role to play in the profession and, and also in the policy landscape to really champion the importance of school leadership. And I just can't emphasize enough about that. I mean, I don't know whether it is the right, I have to be careful but you know as you we know it well the what works movement has provided a lot of evidence about what works and what doesn't work in the classroom in schools but there's also a risk of actually thinking if i follow one particular innovation my school is going to be okay my children will suddenly you know improve we know it doesn't work like that yeah. we know that you know like um professor Tony Bright has written a, a, a fabulous piece in education research a few years ago about the, improve, the importance of this improvement science. But I think what is missing is really is, is for to think, you know, talking about school improvement and the fundamental role of the school leader in terms of shaping that improvement agendas. It really is the key. I've been to, you know, thinking of, because I think that really plays us at, at, in connection with other ongoing and current policy movements within schools and um, really provide the best evidence and to challenge school leaders to think um, the risk of following the trend, actually to focus on what are the fundamentals in terms of leadership that makes a difference. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm just at the moment writing a, a think piece with Louise Stowe and 
we really wanted us to rethink the importance of leadership in relation to the what works agenda. Um, it's you know it's it's great to, for the profession to see the evidence, but also it is important um, for the profession to understand. Unless you have the school leaders who can direct the teachers um, to know how to use those evidence and make it work, not only just in one classroom, but in all the classrooms within the school, it's highly unlikely we will be able to see sustained change in practice, which there is very limited evidence as, as you know, we, we, we probably both know, as you know, and also to, to see sustained um, improvement in, in children's achievement, like, you know, we, we would all feel passionate about. So I do think going back, I think Belmas as a wonderful organization, it's, it's, it's really connecting beautifully um, the academic world with the profession. And I do think that that's, that's very important position needs to be used um, to, you know, involve to think more, um, not following the trend to, to, to think you know how to make what matters in term um what matters in terms of um enabling teachers in schools um to see the difference in the classroom because at the end of the day that's what really matters the and here i'm not just talking about the learning outcomes i'm talking about the learning experiences and the engagement of children yeah no and and i think in our current landscape those learning experiences and that learning engagement has been captured by for example many multi-academy trusts in different ways of you know wanting particularly in primary wanting them to have completed for example a task a list of tasks to do before they transfer to secondary schools but actually what we're talking about is something much deeper than that and creating a sort of holistic purpose for people to engage in that kind of wider understanding of the, of the system so I think that's a really interesting point for me because I do think that Belmas has a greater role to play in terms of the policy landscape and helping leaders to connect with the theory through into that policy landscape almost giving people the confidence to say right this is you know the direction we feel that we should be going in so are we going in that direction at the moment and and if not what do we do about it and i think that's quite an interesting quite an interesting and, and very kind of pertinent pertinent question so that brings us nicely on to the final final question ching which is is there anything else that you would like to see belmas doing moving forward and i, I think you again i think you probably just answered it actually but is there anything else I, I know um, some of our colleagues, I'm saying our colleagues, I mean colleagues in our centre work very closely um, with Belmas. And if anything, um, I do see as a centre, we want to um, connect more closely with Belmas and play our part in that as, as a... Um, as an organization, we, we do, you know, we're not only doing research, but also we have that very strong applied side about yeah. research into practice. So, and so in terms of identity and values and shared passion, um, not about what I would like to see Belmas doing. I want to see us as a center um, working more closely with Belmas and to achieve our shared um, purpose. And that's a lovely note to end our 50th anniversary talk on. Professor Chingu, thank you very much for your time today in answering our questions. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deb. It's, it's a really delight, um, a, a pleasure and an honour for me to be given the opportunity to share my thoughts and experiences. And, um, and I just I'm very grateful. Thank you.